Hello, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you again today to our series of live webinar about the opportunities and challenges of going digital in 2021. I want to welcome today uh, a special guest, uh, Imran Bashir from KPMG. He's an expert in cybersecurity. Today, is our discussion is about cybersecurity um, for small, uh, medium enterprises and uh, family businesses. So here we want to make sure that we are talking to the right audience about the right problems and, um, and the right opportunities. Uh, Imran, uh, Imran, I want just to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to our audience. And then after that, I will take over and we will start diving directly into the topic. Please, Imran, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is uh, Imran Bashir. I'm a uh, partner at uh, KPMG in the cybersecurity practice. I'm also the national public sector cyber leader. And, and the reason for that is because just prior to joining KPMG, I worked in the federal government for uh, quite a while. And in the last few years at the federal government, I, I uh, led the uh, cybersecurity program for them uh, as well. So a lot of background in cybersecurity. And a lot of the, the beauty of the federal government experience is it kind of gives you a, a view of, of departments and agencies and ministries of all different shapes and sizes from the small shop to, to the giant ones. And I think uh, helps kind of tailor security that way. So looking forward to having the chat today. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imran, for being here. Thank you for joining us. I want just to say that uh, uh, you are uh, our last guest uh, for this season. Uh, we're going to take a break for the summer uh, period, and then hopefully we're going to come back uh, with a different format uh, around the September timeline. Uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, the announcements, the right announcements done at the right time. Uh, meanwhile, I, before we start, I always want to thank our uh, platinum sponsor, Agora Office Space. It's the office space based in the Bedford, Nova Scotia, where they are giving us their studio and uh, all the technical equipment to have a live broadcast from there. Also, I want to, to thank our strategic partner, the Chartered Institute of uh, Marketing Management of Ontario. Uh, this is an organization which I am a very proud member and I am uh, acting as their chief strategy officer as well. So having said this, Imran, let us dive directly into our topic. What can you tell us about cybersecurity? Why cybersecurity is important to small businesses and to family-owned businesses? Yeah, look, it's, it's pretty straightforward in that, you know, just think of it from a common sense perspective. We're putting more and more stuff online every day. Like this digital thing is not just a fad anymore. It's something that is here to stay. And like the slide is saying here, it's something that, especially in the context of COVID, you're seeing more and more things go online, which is great, honestly, as, as a customer and as a citizen of the country, it, to have access to all these things at your fingertips is fantastic. Um, the challenge there is that we are, as we do these things, we widen our attack service. And there are bad actors out there. And as much as I'd like to stop them all, they're all out there trying to get access to this sensitive information that is now more and more online. So it's incumbent upon all of us to keep cyber in mind as we move things online more and more. We have to realize these things have to be protected. Uh, just as we used to protect them on-premise in our, in, our, in our buildings, the same levels of protection need to be applied online as well. Yes, you know, I can, I can imagine, especially now that all or most of the businesses are thinking about how to go more online and do online transactions, or they already they are already there, but did they put everything in place? Did, you, did they have all the checks and balances done, right? And this is what we are really uh, caring about. And also we understand, I don't want to really talk a lot about it, but we understand that we have lots of scams happening around us as well. And people taking this opportunity to scam the businesses, right? What can you say about this just before we go into some more technicalities or discussion around the topic? Yeah, no, it, it's so true. I mean, let's be honest, so before this whole digital transformation thing, Cybersecurity was hard enough as it was. Like you know, that's a it's a tough field to be in, I'll be honest. But then you throw digital on top of that, you throw COVID on top of that, and you throw and let's be human about this. The whole COVID situation is about reacting quickly and getting people services quickly. And 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 sure, people are putting stuff online for good reason. And you know, with all due respect to the people doing it, there are have to be some shortcuts taken sometimes. And sometimes those shortcuts to get the thing online happens to be cybersecurity. And of course the bad people know this stuff. And there are like in any walk of life, people looking to take advantage of vulnerabilities. And 
And through no fault of anyone's, because like I said, we we're trying to do a business to people and getting services available. You know, there are some holes in there and there are people that are taking advantage of those holes. And, and, and to your point, the, the scams certainly, and certainly what we've seen have not stopped during COVID. In fact, they've increased like by a factor of three or four um, because of just human nature. Think about something as simple as phishing, for example. You know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard enough as you go through what, hundreds of emails per day to, to, to be super aware 100% of the time. And I know some of the best cyber people that have clicked on links. So let's not all like feel, you know, too bad about doing that. Um, but now we'll throw COVID on top of that and COVID themed phishing links and someone sending an email about a vaccine being available in your neighborhood and, and the human side of you wants to click on it, right? So again, no fault of anyone's, but these people take advantage of our own psychology. And that's what's been, that's what's really tough about the field to be completely honest. Yes, yes, you know, and also what we see as well, lots of uh, email hacking. Even my own email was hacked last year, you know, and without even knowing how, right? And then you have to go through the whole uh, painful process to regain access to all these accounts. And then you will lose as well uh, some credibility towards some of your customer base because they're going to start receiving very odd emails from you. And then on top of that, maybe you ask for payments or whatever, and then like it's a whole can of worms that is being opened, right? Yeah, and, and the sad part is no one is immune to it. Like I've heard some people say, well, we're not, you know, in, in the federal government, for example, we're not the big agencies, we're not the tax agency, no one's gonna come after us. But the crazy part is these people do kind of like spray and pray attacks and that they just put their stuff out there and whoever it hits, it hits. They're not maybe targeting you, but you will be caught in the crossfire, so to speak. And so you wanna make sure you're prepared, at least at the basic level, you know, to defend against some of the, the, those types of attacks. Yes, yes, you know, definitely. And this is why we need to be very vigilant and understanding exactly what's, what's going on. So uh, having said this, uh, le let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, when we talk about trust in cybersecurity, what, what are we really doing? What is the trust? Well, to me, especially, as you mentioned, with everything going online, your, your business, your organization's reputation is on the line with your, with your name, right? So if, if something were to go wrong, like not, not been just like we always get, you know, one, one problem my industry has is we throw all these scary things and, and everyone gets hacked and all this sensitive information gets out and it's all scary. But just put all that stuff aside for a second. Even if it's just your website getting defaced with like a dancing banana, and I've seen this before, but just the fact that there's now a dancing banana on your website, it changes the perception from your customer. If your customer doesn't trust that you can't keep your act together on your website or on your, on your online presence, that might lead them to have second thoughts to do business with you. And so it, people start worry about, oh, well, I haven't been breached. It's not that big of a deal. It, it, it's all these little things that chip away at your credibility. And that to me is the most important part whether public or private sector, your trust, your reputation, your credibility, that's your currency with your customers. And as soon as you lose that, it is really hard to regain. There's a quote, I'm gonna butcher it probably, but it's like, trust takes years to build, seconds to break and forever to repair. And that's in life in general, but I love that for cybersecurity as well, because I think that's that's really true. And, and for us to make sure that we're doing these things, this, this digital thing, which I, again, I'll repeat that I love, you really want to make sure you get it right from the start because you may not get a second chance to do it. Okay, so how can we translate now this to small and small businesses, family businesses? Like if they want to start by building trust uh, and, and trying to secure in a way their, their digital assets. So wh where should they start? Can you just give us just a few guidelines, right? Without going lots of into details about technicalities, but yeah. where should I go? What should I do? Well, it's, I will be honest again, cybersecurity is a very intimidating field. And, and, and uh, you know, if I can be frank, I don't think the, sometimes the vendor community does us any favors by, you know, showing all these shiny widgets or fancy toys you can buy um, that will solve all your problems. Because I'll tell you right now, there is no such technology that is a silver bullet to solve all your cyber problems. So you can put that aside for a second. Uh, what I will say is there's also, it's really tough to get perfect cybersecurity. And, and like I said, not only is it intimidating, I think cyber is a bit of a, uh, it could be a bit of a money pit, if I'm being honest with you. You can pour as much money as you want into it and still not be at, you know, 110%. And so what I think is really important for small, medium enterprise, and, and it's, it's a quote I use often, is to find the Goldilocks approach. Not too much, not too little, but just right. And the just right changes 
depending on the context. I, I mentioned, you know, I was from the federal government. One of the departments I worked with was Department of National Defense. One of the other departments I worked with was Polar Knowledge Canada. Those are two very different organizations. With all due respect to both of them, one has a very different security posture than the other. And so to me, it is about understanding your, your business, understanding who's at, what are your sensitive assets. In some businesses, maybe everything is public. Maybe you don't care about as much as some of the more critical data. That's fine. Your security posture is different. I think step one, this is not a sexy thing, by the way, but step one is just understand what your critical assets are. This is, you realize I'm not, there's no tool or technology I'm selling here. I'm just saying, sit down and go through a list of your critical assets, understand where they're housed. We call that the crown jewels. And it's the same principle as like, I, I'm looking at a safe right now in my house. I, my safe is about maybe a foot by a foot. Like I can only fit a certain amount of things in that safe to protect. And so I'm not going to put my nice little McDonald's coupons here into the safe as much as I, I love my fries. I will put maybe my, my jewelry or some sensitive documents or, or whatever in that safe. And the same principle applies for cyber. You cannot spend all your money to protect all your things to the same level. The important part is to, to identify what's important and what justifies that spend and tailor that accordingly. So long-winded way of saying step one, identify what's important. Step two, protect what's important. And then step three is don't rest on just prevention. Like the, the thing with cybersecurity, my favorite analogy is uh, the firefighter analogy. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and when you, when you of course we don't want fires to happen in our house, right? We build our houses uh, with the right electrical codes and everything else to make sure fires don't, we don't walk around with open flames all the time. But at the same time, we also build our house with smoke detectors. We also have fire hydrants on the street. We also have fire stations uh, a few kilometers away. And the reason for that is because you are trying to pre prevent as much as possible, but you're also ready to detect and respond as quickly as possible to contain the damage. And cyber is no different. You, you protect it to the greatest extent and just have measures in place to detect if something goes wrong. There's no shame in that and respond quickly so that you can address it as promptly as possible. Wow, this is a great analogy. Like It's like, it's not just one thing, right? It's a set of many things that are going to make you less vulnerable or more secured, right? So this is definitely something which we need to... Um, to retain as 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 a great advice coming from coming from an expert like you uh, who who has been doing this kind of stuff for for like years and years, right? So when when we when we establish the trust, right, we need to start looking at okay, cybersecurity, as you said, uh, sh we shouldn't be afraid of discussing it. Uh, so what can you? Tell us about the perception around this topic. So how is it perceived and what are a little bit the misconception around it and how are we as small business owners, family businesses are going to be able to really tackle this topic without much fear or, or, um, or just thinking that it's a huge burden on our shoulders? Yeah, you just know that word there is, is what worries me sometimes with cyber. I do think people do feel it's, it's a burden or it's intimidating or that it's it's, it's just going to cost a lot or, or it's going to slow things down. I've heard all these things before. And look, if done poorly, yeah, it will do all those things. And, and for me, part of my education process for, for my own uh, cyber community is that we have to play a role in changing these perceptions too. Cyber does not have to be difficult. Cyber doesn't have to be expensive and cyber doesn't have to be complicated. Like it, it can be, like I said, uh, but it's really important that we understand uh, business context. And I think this is the onus on, on practitioners to say, okay, like, I'll give you an example from, from my old job in that there was a, a pilot we wanted. This is going to age myself a bit. We used to use Blackberries all the time. And when, when the first department wanted to introduce a, an iPhone or something, a new smartphone, I remember there was a, a, a CIO that went to their IT staff and said, okay, make that secure. And so you ask a security person to make something secure, they will lock everything down. And guess what happens when you turn off um, all of the GPS and the camera and all the app store and Twitter and Facebook and everything else? You have a thousand dollar flip phone, like it doesn't do anything. And so, yes, it's secure, but it didn't, it doesn't really meet the business objective. And when you do that exercise again with business context and the person explained, well, this is for my field officers to take pictures and do analysis and you need all this stuff. All of a sudden, then you tailor security to meet that objective. And you can get a pretty secure phone that enables that business. And the difference between those two scenarios is that user one gets a, piece of garbage that doesn't really do anything and user two gets a smartphone that's enabled for their business and that user is much happier so my long-winded story here is to say 
really it starts with understanding what the business context is, understanding what the threats are, and then putting the right amount of security in it. Did that organization need to be 100% locked down? No. But then if you ask maybe a military officer that same question, maybe they would be given the context they're in. So uh, it really starts with conversations, honestly. And, and I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that cybersecurity is just some backroom nerd thing that the IT guys will take care of or whatever. And maybe that was true in the past. I'm telling you with 100% certainty, it is a business problem now. Like it is no different than, you know, we, we say it's a board level discussion. You talk about pandemics or power outages or earthquakes or whatever at your board, cyber is on the same thing. Like these are all disruptive things to your business and need to be treated, you know, with the same level of, uh, of, of uh, you know, interest. Yes, you know, and, and actually you, you just uh, talked about something very important. And definitely cybersecurity is, it is, is not just at a board level. It is at every employee's level, right? Because we hold on our laptops, on our phones, uh, lots of valuable information about the company just because we have emails on our phone, right? So now we have lots of sensitive information. And then sometimes, you know, I even sometimes say cyber sec security might not be very uh, IT related. It's just behavioral. Like don't leave your phone on the desk or on a, a, in a public place on a, on a table and then go to the washrooms and come back. You don't know who, and just not to steal it, but just to open it, check what you have. And I think this is the first level of cyber security, right? <laughs> You're right. It, it is. I always, it's a team sport and I think everyone plays a role in it. I don't think it's, it's one person's problem to solve by themselves. And that's why I don't even like the idea of making this IT person the go-to for all things cyber. And that's your problem. And if it's, if it's something goes wrong, you're fired. Like that's not the case. It is something we all collectively do. And, and you know, it's funny, we do it with everything else. Imagine finance, for example, in your organization, everyone in your organization knows you're not gonna leave a bag of money on an open table, like you just described. We have to have that same mentality about other things. It has to be basic, you know, a human instinct to say, of course, we don't leave our phones out there. Of course, we don't leave sensitive files on a USB stick and out on, on public, just like we wouldn't leave papers on a bus. For some reason, we haven't made the full transition to the digital world yet, but it, it starts with education and awareness. Yes, definitely, definitely. So now that we have built the trust, we are trying to understand how to change the perception towards uh, cybersecurity that technically it can start with very small things, uh, inexpensive things. So it doesn't mean that you need to spend tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to be in a way uh, secured uh, from, from an IT perspective. Uh, so now the next one is we need to understand how the users are behaving, right? And I think this a, a picture which you shared with us is really saying it all, right? So what? how can you uh, bring this picture uh, to the cybersecurity world? Yeah, I, I, the reason I like this picture so much is because I find um, our, our industry seems to blame users a lot. Oh, if we didn't have users, we, you know, we'd be fine. It's all the users that call, cause all the problems. The thing is, if we didn't have users, we wouldn't have a job either. So, I mean, users are, are the reason we do this. And we want to make sure their journeys are safe and secure. And my my argument with any kind of user of any system is that, and myself included, users like to circumvent inefficiency. And if I have anything inefficient in my life, I try to find a more efficient way to do it. But if cybersecurity is that inefficiency, your organization suffers. And I, I think of silly things that we've done in this field, and we still do today. And, and one that bothers me the most is, is passwords. And, and passwords are something that back in, I think it was the 70s, some, some genius, a, a mathematical, and he's right, genius, said that if we have complex passwords, um, it makes it harder to hack. And, you know, of course, a capital letter, lowercase, exclamation, or whatever, a special character, makes sense mathematically. From a user perspective, what all that did to us now over time, and, and I know a lot of you listening probably have the same pattern, is that you end up just making it efficient for yourself. Maybe it's a capital letter, lowercase letters, exclamation mark, and maybe you rotate the special character uh, every month when you have to change it. It's not really helping security at this point. It's almost security theater. And so even this guy who wrote this policy back in the 70s has really recently admitted he made a big mistake with passwords in that you know he didn't take into account the user behavior for it. So if we're doing things that make it clunky for our users, and I, I firmly believe passwords is one of our worst offenses, um, we, we're doing something wrong. So, for, so now, for example, the password guidance out there that is well uh, accepted in the industry 
is, is longer lowercase passwords instead of, so for example, a 14 letter lowercase password is not only mathematically stronger than an eight character complex password, but also easier to remember, easier to type, easier to type in your phone, you're not switching keyboards and things. And it's just funny, these simple things actually make a lot, a big difference. I, I realize I'm picking on passwords, but security is full of these little um, aspects where we can do a hell of a lot better job making it easier for our users to use the systems, which then make it more secure for everyone. Yes, definitely. You know, and, uh, and you're talking about passwords, and I think this is probably one of the lowest levels of security still necessary, right? Uh, you know, and, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was reading an article talking about how people, for example, now especially they are adding like surveillance cameras and uh, all these cameras have an online access where you can access them from an app and this kind of stuff. And then people are getting hacked. And I just want to say, just to follow up on what you're saying, that uh, a password 101 course would tell you, please change the default username and password from admin admin to something else, just as a first step, right? Otherwise you are going to be hacked for sure. And this is what we're seeing, like people are being hacked at home in the offices. Uh, and then they say that camera system is not secured. Yeah, and th this is where some of that basic hygiene I, I talked about comes in. Like for everything, for example, some of those things, I just bought one of those fancy doorbells, same principle. Any account you have online, uh, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, there's options nowadays to just enable second factor authentication, a little fingerprint to add to it. And, and it's a simple thing like that that I think the industry needs to do better as well. This is not always on the users themselves. Um, but if you have that option on any device you have, enable it because it gives you that added layer and, and security is honestly all about layers. The more layers you apply, the more things someone has to break to get through it. and yeah. you make it easy for them. It's, it's no different than, you know, the locks on your door or, or you know, that there's a reason you have a little lock and a, and a big deadbolt and there are layers of security physically, same thing applies online, but there are measures you can take really easily with your own devices that don't cost you a thing, but maybe 10 seconds to click a checkbox. Yeah. You know, I, I just want also to agree that we shouldn't all the time blame the users. You know, I am coming from a technology and telecom background, and I know how sometimes when a product is more de um, designed by uh, engineers and technical people, they a little bit forget about the user experience. Yeah. And this is why when the user experience is difficult or not so friendly, then the user is going to drop it. And hence we drop security with it because it's too difficult for us to cope with it. And we need to make sure, and we need to, it's, it's a fact that not everybody is technology savvy, right? So we need to simplify the user interfaces and simplify the user experiences. Otherwise we're going to all the time hit this kind of problems, right? You got it. And, and this is designing with the users in mind, not only applies to cyber, it applies to digital in general. I think we, um, we, we haven't historically done a good job of doing that. And, and now, but you look at some devices, like my, my mother, who, who never used a technology in most of her life, is pretty adept at using her smartphone because they made it really easy for her to log in with her finger or her face or whatever the case may be. And that, and the irony is that she's actually way more secure than her old pin of 1111 which didn't make it, but it was easy to type in. And, yeah. and again, because they made it easy. So you can have usability and security at the same time if it's built in and baked in the right way. So to me, it's a lot of, as you're doing any kind of digital work, making sure you understand what your users want and designing things properly you know, from the outset. It'll go a long way for security and usability, which is win-win. Yeah, yes, definitely. So, so technically what we need to talk about, especially for for um, small businesses and the family businesses whom actually this topic is for them today. We're not talking about the huge organizations. Yeah. We're not going to talk how KPMG is handling their internal cybersecurity. I was in the past uh, an employee of KPMG in, in Saudi Arabia, and I know what are the different levels. And this discussion is not about this kind of organizations. Today, it's more about the small businesses, family businesses. So. First thing that comes to my mind is that once we know, as you said, step one, do the checklist, understand what you really want to secure, what really is worthwhile securing, what is not. Uh, second is try to understand that uh, uh, what it takes for you to start doing the security level uh, in terms of investment. And now here, when we talk about the users, what's coming to my mind is that we need to train the users, right? 
many times we build this kind of layers of security and then we don't really train the users about how to use them and then what's going to happen our human nature is going to tell us okay how can i break the rules how can i bypass now a system that is becoming so cumbersome just because i don't know how to use it well rather than let me train you so that you really understand why this is important and you know uh, as in anything understanding the why is the most important thing before starting doing uh, what you're doing right you got it and this goes back to the team sport analogy you're right that training and awareness is a huge part of any uh, cybersecurity strategy and, and honestly gets overlooked a lot um, and quite frankly a lot of times because people like to uh, buy some of that fancy technology that goes into the into the widgets and, and, and the lights get blinky and stuff. But the challenge with some of that is that if you were spending all your money on the technology side, you, you have to remember that there's a triad I like to remember. It's people, process, and technology. And they all need equal investment. And a lot of people layer on the technology because it, it does seem easy. It seems like you can write a check and buy a thing and it'll solve your problem. But you forget that people have to use that technology and there have to be processes in place to ensure the repeatable and consistent use of that technology. So just, I guess my, my other piece of advice is don't get too locked into one of those three aspects. Make sure that e each of them get equal time. And, and again, the other two, it, it's hard because the, the sexy stuff is always the technology. I, I, the nerd in me loves playing with the new gadgets that come out, I'll be honest. But the bulk of my time is spent with small clients talking about some of the, what I, you know, people might call boring stuff, but I think the important stuff on procedurally, how are you, patching your systems? How often do you patch them? Um, how are your users accessing? Do you, do, you, do you give them the appropriate training and awareness? Um, on the access control side, when they leave the company, do you revoke access? Like you'd be surprised. These are, these sound like simple things, but yeah. you'd be surprised of how many breaches happen because of Joe Blow who left the company has, still has an active account. And that account just runs wild because some hacker realizes it hasn't been used and has full rights. And, and what I call basic hygiene, this is the the brushing your teeth three times a day. Don't worry about all the fancy floss and water picks and everything else. Just brush your teeth <laughs> a little bit and you'll go a long way. This is the basic brushing of teeth. If I use a dent, I'm an allergies person. So oh, that's perfect. I, I do the same in order to, to show the real picture, right? So it's uh, definitely very helpful. And, uh, and I cannot agree more how many times we forget to revoke access or to, to, to delete a user, right? Or, or to give or to change the access rights because sometimes even... A, a, an employee might move positions within the company. One day, this employee needs this access rights, and then in the new role, they need maybe different. And exactly. then sometimes we forget about them, and they, they still have access. And then we might have, I don't want to call internal fraud, but internal mismanagement of data. And then if we don't have a good uh, logs and trackers about who did what, then everything is lost, right? Yeah, absolutely right. And, and I, I, you know, insider threats, people always make it sound malicious. There's a lot of accidental insider threats. Yes, yes. Like if I still had access to information I didn't need, you know, th th that could be an accidental disclosure that I inadvertently, you know, went to. And it's funny because in the physical world, and I think about some old jobs I had, you know, when I was a student or whatever before, you know, moving on this field. But, you know, if you were working in a company where you had a key to a garage and you changed jobs in that company, they'd say, please give me that key back. I'll give that to the next person who has that job, who gets the key to the garage. You now work in the, in the side room or something. We don't do that return of keys digitally. We just accumulate keys if you think about it. And, and that to me is, is a really scary thing in the digital world because if I, and I worked in my last company for 10 years, 10 years is a long time to accumulate keys because I did have four or five different jobs. Um, and, and so just think about that in your particular context and, and that, you know, some of these, ba and I, again, basic hygiene elements of, just giving people the right access to the information they need for their job. And, and again, doesn't sound super sexy, but it's a pretty complex thing to think about. You have to think about, you know, role-based access control is what it's called technically, but it can be done on paper if it has to be, just making sure you track this stuff uh, and, and ensure that nothing is given uh, in, in excess, which I think we tend to do digitally because it's easy. There is no physical key we have to collect or, or, or whatever. So there is no cost to clicky clicky. Uh, but there is a cost long term if it uh, if it gets compromised. Yes, definitely. So we can talk a lot about the users because uh, I always say, you know, the the most important asset is your is your is your customers, is the people, is the is your uh, employees, and all these together have more information maybe than any of the systems, right? And we need to really understand 
how to enable the people who are having access because when we talk about employees sometimes also you give your customers some access to some of your portals internal folders whatever it is right and then you need to make sure for example that they are not on the same server that they are you know in a different uh, environment so that you just in a way compartmentalize how to say to put different com compartments and and make sure that everything is is separate between internal access external access and Sometimes we fail to do that. Uh, so, right. so to move forward, you know, one step further. I love this picture. <laughs> As you said, one size doesn't fit all. And I cannot agree more in anything in business. We cannot just say that this is, you know, the solution that works for everybody. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, no, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about different sizes, different contexts, different threat models. Um, you know, you, you have to put your, what I do in my daily job, I try to put myself in the shoes of the bad guys. And like, what am I after with, with each company? And if I'm after, uh, I don't know, the tax agency versus, uh, you know, the Department of National Defense versus an energy company, my targets are going to be different. So if my targets are different, the, 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 the defenses have to be different because you have to tailor this for your particular context, which means, uh, you know, you can't copy paste cybersecurity. And then I know, you know, and I realize I'm a consultant and, and people hire consultants and they get a lot of these checklists. I don't, I, checklists drive me nuts because you cannot apply the same controls by a list to people. It has to be more contextual. It has to be the sit down with the business, understand what they're trying to protect and tailor accordingly. And so that's something, you know, we try really hard to do. And it, it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be scary. It is just about understanding. And, and to me, that's one of the, I think that's one of the biggest misnomers about cybersecurity is, is that, you know, it, it is something, and we talked about earlier, the word intimidating. Um, and I think it's because we see some of these big, like the banks are spending a lot of money in cyber. And that's, that's great, but their context is completely different than the small business that, you know, works down the street for me here. Um, and it, you shouldn't, it's not a race to see who can spend the most. It's, it's about how to spend the right amount in your particular business. And, you know, people always ask me, what's the right percentage of your budget to spend on on cyber, there is no right percentage because again, it's really it's really tailored that way. So, you know, my encouragement is again, start with the data, start with who needs to get access to it and work your way up the control stack that way. And don't, you don't have to be, you're not a bank, so don't try to spend like a bank, um, but also don't do nothing either. So you got to find that in between. Okay, that's, that's great, Imran. L let me just ask you a question over here. So, uh, we shouldn't ignore the fact that many of the small, medium enterprises, family businesses don't have everything online in a digital format, right? Yeah. So um, in a way, some of them are trying to move away from the paper-based running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, so what kind of advice we can give them to start moving into the digital environment but also while keeping some level of safety and security at the beginning. And, uh, you know, I think that some people are not moving into the online mode, or I would say the digital mode, just because they always feel that paper is safer than, than the digital assets, yeah. right? So how can we also take these kind of companies into a journey of moving away from the paper-based, into the digital assets while uh, in a way easing their pain and telling them that you are still secured. Yeah, it's funny with the, the whole paper thing, anything in the analog world, we always feel more safe when we can touch it, uh, quite frankly. But, but you know, the challenge with even paper is you don't know how many copies of that paper are sitting somewhere. You don't know if someone took a photocopy and left the building with it. And there are, there are challenges with status quo too. So I guess my first piece of advice is don't underestimate the risk of status quo either. I and mean, just because you mean touch things doesn't make it more secure. Um, but I, so my encouragement is to make sure you understand there still needs to be access control on the paper thing. Like that, that key to that file folder still needs to be controlled as to who gets that key. It can't be copied to every employee, you know, in the building if it's all your sensitive financial stuff. So the, and I bring that up because the same principles in analog need to apply to digital. So as you're moving to digital, which like you said, Mark, is inevitable anyway, whether you've started the journey or are thinking about the journey, the journey is going to happen sooner or later. And so as you move on it, the, the time to build cybersecurity is, is now. And, and I, again, I'm going to go with an analogy. 
but if it's like building a house, putting up the drywall, would you rather put the electrical before the drywall or after the drywall? And, and there's a one, you can do it both ways. One is way more expensive than the other. And my advice for cybersecurity is that same, put the cyber or electrical before the drywall goes up so that you know you're doing it right from the outset. So as you're designing your digital journey, as you're moving to things like cloud and, and all these new technologies that are coming out, just have your, your have cyber at the discussion. Start talking about it early. My, um, my uh, you know, I used to always say, we my old job, we bake it in at the very outset. When someone just had a project that was a glimmer in their eye that, hey, we want to do this in three years, cyber sits at the table and has a conversation with, where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? And let me make sure I put the right amounts along the way. Because what often happens, and going back to that perception I talked about earlier, these projects go in full gear. So at the very end, just before it goes live, someone says, oh, can we do a quick cyber check on this? And then you're overwhelmed with all these things that you know should have been addressed earlier and cost a bunch. And that leads to the perception of, oh my God, cyber's slowing me down, or oh my God, cyber's so expensive. But the reason for that is because it was delayed. So my my only piece of advice is to start it early, engage it early, and you'll you'll see a huge difference in return on investment. Yes, yes, you know, and and then here you touched on the cloud aspect, and without go going a lot into lots of technicalities, for the people who are really uh, very concerned, they can still go into a private cloud versus a public cloud, and then this would be a completely different discussion based on the investment levels and the needs if they want to do so. So I just before we continue, I just want to remind our audience who is now with us on Zoom and um, on Facebook that you can, if you are on Zoom, you can um, ask your questions to Imran uh, on the Q&A section or in the chat. So please, I encourage you to do so. And if you are on Facebook, please leave a comment on the Facebook page and then we'll be more than happy to uh, respond to your questions. Uh, so uh, Imran, now to go back to our topic and uh, we discussed about uh, the, the, the size uh, or it's not a one size that fits all businesses. So this means that we can tailor cybersecurity to our own level, to our own uh, investment level, to our own needs. And this is what is really highly recommended. You cannot copy paste or take what a company A did and then just implement it on company B uh, just because sometimes it just doesn't work. Systems are different. Uh, it depends on the integration as well and on the solutions. So having said this, we, we talked about this kind of sizing and, and the budget size. So next one is how to manage the risk. Uh, we know that we can manage the risk in different ways. Uh, you can, you know, and I always say business is about managing risks. When you take a decision, this means that which risk you're willing to take and which risk is you're not willing to take, whether to employ someone, to uh, rent an office or to go into business or have a partner and then up to cybersecurity and your IT systems. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, I know you're exactly right there. And, and for some reason, we lose this concept of risk management in cybersecurity sometimes. And and I've always said a cybersecurity person's job is never to say no. I, I have never said no to anything. I think my answer is always uh, sure. And here are the risks uh, you can accept in these situations. And, and obviously, some of the risks are severe and people have second thoughts. But but my job is to uh, advise on risk. And, and like you said, Everyone has this problem in every other walk of life, any, every other area of business. You know, I love to say every company can spend hundreds of millions of dollars in cybersecurity. I also know the reality of every company has a whole bunch of other priorities in their in their day to day lives, mainly of delivering the business that they're in. Cybersecurity is like this much of it, and so my my job is to make sure that whatever that this much is, if it's this much, this much, or this much. Um, gets just the, the right amount of attention and, and is spent in the right areas. So, you know, from a risk management perspective, it, it is just about that. It's about understanding, uh, you know, what is the what is the worst case scenario and, and, and how bad is it for your organization if it were to be compromised? And, you know, it's, it's very similar. And what, what mitigations can you put in place to avoid? And I'll say mitigations because it doesn't always have to be perfect. It's the same thing as us in our daily lives. Every day we cross the street, there is a risk we get hit by a car every single day, but we keep crossing the street and we keep crossing the street because we take, say we have safeguards. We look both ways before crossing the street. We wait for the, the green light or the, and that walkie, the guy who says to walk uh, before we cross a crosswalk. You know, uh, uh, when I'm with, sometimes you take your headphones out to make sure you hear horns. Like there are mitigations you can take 
and accept the little risk that comes with crossing the street. And otherwise we'd all be staying at home and not going anywhere worse than the lockdown you know, that we're in. Um, and cyber is no different. So I think when it comes to risks, I guarantee you every system that is on the internet right now, by nature of the internet itself, there are inherent risks. Like the only way I'll tell you right now to be risk-free in cyber, disconnect all your things from the internet and go sit in the woods and uh, you know, drink your rainwater because you know, there's no way to be 100% risk-free uh, in cybersecurity uh, with the internet on. So it's a matter of understanding what's acceptable. And so maybe putting a, you know, a service out there that has a few patches missing, but the key patches that access the key data are protected and the other ones will get to in 30 days, maybe that's okay for your company. I can't say that up front because I don't know your company's uh, particular businesses, but that's the type of context you have to look at. And you know, if you were to spend all your money patching everything all the time, um, as much as a cyber person should say patch everything, the reality is you can't, especially when you have probably one IT resource wearing four different hats. Um, it's a matter of prioritization. And that's where risk management comes in. Get the high priority ones absolutely taken care of. The medium ones have a plan for. The low ones maybe don't have to be addressed right away, but just keep them on your radar. And that to me is the way to make cybersecurity a bit more manageable, especially for small organizations. Wow, these are great advice, Imran, because, uh, you know, I can guarantee you that uh, uh, not every every business owner is uh, is uh, is into the topic of, of, of even IT, not yet to talk about cybersecurity. And uh, sometimes we need to give some guidelines where to start, what to do. Uh, and again, as you said, you want to be 100% safe. Don't have a Google account. Don't have a Facebook account. Don't have an email address, uh, right? Don't even have an internet page. Uh, then right. <laughs> it kind of puts you out of business pretty quickly. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, one one thing you know, one thing we do a lot, especially with, with with small businesses. And again, you don't need to spend a lot of money. I'm talking like like less than 20k sometimes to get you something that gets you an assessment of your current state maturity of, of where you are in cybersecurity an assessment of a desired future state. And, and keep in mind, you know, for cyber maturity, you don't have to be five out of five on everything. Heck, banks aren't five out of five on everything. Sometimes your two out of five is good enough for your context. And then the, the question is, what is your roadmap to get from your maybe one out of five to two out of five? And that to me is what I always recommend small enterprises to do. This is not a labor intensive process um, and, and not just a KPMG sales pitch here. A lot of organizations do this. But I, I would highly recommend anyone just take, take a glance at your current state, your f desired future state, and a little bit of a roadmap. And it gets you a long way into just advancing your maturity as something that I call like ad hoc, where Joe or Jill from IT just knows the stuff in their head, to something more repeatable so that you know that if Joe or Jill were to leave one day, your processes and, and people and technologies are continued to evolve. So, so that's just a basic kind of tip as well. Yeah, definitely, you know, and uh, and we all, you know, as everything in business, managing risk is key at all levels of, of, of your uh, uh, business interaction with anything you are doing with the external world and even your internal world. Uh, you know, again, I think this is well said when you say that don't let perfect get in the way of good enough, right? So how can we make it just good enough and not look at perfection at this level? Yeah, and yeah, this is one of my favorite quotes and two, two reasons, mainly because, you know, I, I talk pretty quickly and I go through a whole bunch of stuff and I want people to leave with one message. And this is always the message I want them to leave with because uh, it, is, it is hard to be perfect in anything in life. I don't think there is such a thing and cyber is no different. For me, it's, it's about making incremental changes toward better every single day. And so if, if it's today, uh, a few of you go home and enable two-factor authentication on your camera or on your router or on your phone. That's a win for me. And if the next day you do something different and every day there's an incremental kind of approach to better cybersecurity, um, that to me is what the strategy needs to be. I, you know, I, I've heard too many vendors promise the world when it comes to cyber. I, I'm more of a, pragma a pragmatic, a realistic person that says, this, this the environment changes so quickly. Every day something new comes out. Every day there's a new headline. Every day there's a new vulnerability. It is in the field it's overwhelming. I cannot imagine how it, it's overwhelming to be someone who's not in the field. And so it's easier when you just kind of chunk it off in the baby steps, make it manageable. If, if you, for argument's sake, said, 
My next task in my organization is just going to, I'm going to build, you know, a small little one pager incident response plan. Like if something goes wrong, here's who I notify, here's who I call, here's what I do. That is a huge step if you don't have one already. It's, it's again, going back to my fire analogy. There's a reason we all have fire escape plans in our buildings. And there's a reason we test these plans on a, on a quarterly or annual basis, because you want to make sure your people know where to go when a fire hits. You want to know you have your meeting spot. You want to test it a few times, do drills. The same thing with cyber. If you were to do a small plan and run a fake cyber exercise in the next year, I'd say that's a huge win for your organizations. These little things that aren't super, not very expensive at all, honestly, and, and, and quite uh, informative will take you a, a long way to just, again, keeping getting better every single day. Yes, yes, you know, and, and also what just came to my mind is that, uh, you know, like, like the fire alarm is that if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't trigger, this doesn't mean that the danger is not there, right? Exactly. And you always hope that it doesn't trigger because you don't want to have a fire. And the same is with cybersecurity is that some people would put something in place and then they would, as we said, you know, and again, I will go back to the users and to the training and then they stop following the protocols just because over the past two, three years, nothing happened. So they say like, why now? And now I am stopping following the protocols. And then all of a sudden, they don't really realize that by stopping or actually by following the protocols, this is maybe what prevented anything of happening and yeah. then or from happening. And now when they are relaxing this, they are opening the door for, cy for, 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 uh, for cyber attacks. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, something happened and it's a slippery slope, right? So we just need to remain vigilant and trust that if we have a protocol in place, it's there to protect us. It's not just there to make our life miserable, right? That's right. And, and again, it's, it's constant practice and, and awareness. And, and I can't emphasize do those two things enough. As human beings, put cyber aside. For us to get better at anything, it's practice. And for us to keep our our mind sharp, it's always awareness. It's the same reason, you know, you got to renew uh, your training on some of your certifications in, in life once in a while. And, and it's the same reason, you know, you do a driver's test and driver's training and you, you still drive and, and, you know, you practice that every time. And, and so all these types of things help you get better at, at everything in life and, and cyber is no different. So yeah, for sure. That's my encouragement. And, and, and I look to, look to other domains, like the fire domain is a good one because there's a lot of parallels you could draw there and, and how you react. And, and I would actually argue the likelihood of a fire in your building versus a cyber attack on your on your systems are quite different. I would say the cyber is probably more likely nowadays. And, and, and I would argue that we certainly don't do enough preparation as we do for fires. So let's try to get that maturity up a bit as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's a mindset, right? Or, or actually, it's more like a lifestyle or a business lifestyle and also a personal lifestyle. Because, again, uh, we saw even... Uh, at the highest level, and uh, if I want to go back to the to the U.S. politics, we saw how they mixed personal emails with business emails at the highest level of the of the government, talking about presidents and uh, and candidates and this kind of stuff. And then also at our own level, we mix a lot between a private email and the business email, and then we we just think that it's okay. Yeah. Whereas probably we are also putting our, our business at risk at different levels. Yeah. And for me, honestly, a lot of that comes to just knowing that it's happening. And if you can make an informed decision, like if you are a company that knows that's happening in your, in your business, but understands that, okay, well, I don't have any sense of information. I don't collect credit cards or, or user information. And I'm okay with that. That goes back to what we said earlier. That's an informed risk management decision. For me, the, the, the key word there is informed. If you don't know what's happening, you can't make the risk management decision. So it's all about information gathering, learn your environments, know what's going on, and then make your decisions. I will never judge anyone who says that, that I've, I've understood that my, my users are doing this and I accept it. Well, that's, that's your context and good for you. If it was the, you know, the RCMP or, or somewhere else, I would suspect they wouldn't accept it. And so, uh, so that's how it goes. So, yeah. It, yes, uh, it's, you know, as you said, we need to really understand all the touch points in our business, understand all our systems, understand what, what is important, what is not important. You know, and I always say that uh, 
to protect information that are transactional information. It's not all the time about monetary values or monetary or, or transactions around money, right? It's about contract signing, information sharing, um, anything that has, as you said, private information, not necessarily a credit card number, but it could be a social insurance number, right? It could be Absolutely. anything, uh, even, even a, a home address. It's so private and it's so, inf so important, maybe just not to say where people are living and just put it outside. You know, I saw many people sometimes um, posting online, doing like a presentation and they show sensitive internal information on a PowerPoint presentation or, you know, when they are sharing the screen or, you know, even, even worse, when they don't use virtual backgrounds, sometimes they have their whiteboards behind them with numbers, names, figures, name of clients, future plans. And then like, it's like basic, basic knowledge of how to protect your information while using even this kind of tools like Zoom, like Facebook Live, LinkedIn Live, and this kind of, you know, just like it's mind blowing, right? I, th I think a lot of our, our problems stem from this issue of almost oversharing. Like there's a, there's a principle of what we call data minimization. And the key principle there is only collect what you need. And, and, and so from a cyber perspective, the more you collect, the more you have to protect. And I didn't mean to rhyme that, but that should be a good saying. <laughs> um, but, but basically, if you are collecting a whole bunch of stuff and you don't need it, you, it your cyber becomes cheaper when you could dispose or, or, or maybe change your policies in terms of what you're collecting. Collect, I guess my advice is, collect the bare minimum you require for your transaction. And, and so that's something we've all been working towards in all sectors is trying to get that data minimization principle implemented so that you're not put in a position where you have to protect this, this treasure trove of data when you really only need a small subset of it. And, and let's be honest, like public sector is facing the same challenge. How many times have I shared my information with different levels of government or different departments when really they only need to know X, Y, or Z. And that's, that's, this is a bigger um, system, systemic problem here, but it is something that we all need to get on the same page to address. Yes, oh my God, there is so much to think about. Yeah. But again, we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's not like super overwhelming, but we need to, as you said, we need to just do this at the beginning, the inventory of what is important to us and then start working step-by-step uh, even if you cannot cover everything at once, still, as you said, this is an informed decision. So I know what kind of risks I am running by not covering everything at once, but also I know what are my capabilities and my internal capacity to, to cover the cybersecurity topic. And then I should anyway start from somewhere, right? Rather than saying, oh my God, this is a topic which I don't know much about it. So better not to tackle it rather than starting to tackle it, tackling it in baby steps. That's right. It, it, like I said earlier, it changes so dynamically that a vulnerability today could be five vulnerabilities tomorrow. And that's why this incremental progress, you know, is, is important. And just to your point, but just understanding if you have, I'm going to throw a, a Windows server out there right now that, that you know is vulnerable, that's, a, that's okay if you know it's vulnerable. Because then the next day, some big announcement comes out about Windows vulnerability. Well, then you can say, oh, be I knew it was vulnerable before. Now it's even more. I'm going to take the step to address it. But you have that knowledge. Without that knowledge, you just kind of open yourselves up to more and more things as the days pass. And so with cyber being as dynamic as it is, you know, uh, even if you don't have a vulnerability right now, tomorrow a new one comes out. It's just about keeping tabs of what's there, what's important. And the question I always ask or people ask themselves is if you were at, after your own business, if you were a competitor or a, or a bad actor, what would you go after? And you put yourself in that mindset of what would you go after will help you decide what to protect first and then just work your way up from that. Yes, yes, definitely. So Imran, I don't know if you noticed, time is flying. Oh, I didn't even notice. No, but I can talk about this for hours, as you know. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I have to keep track of time, right? We always promise our, our listeners and viewers that uh, we will uh, keep our webinars uh, up to an hour of discussion. We've been already... Uh, here uh, almost for an hour. So um, unfortunately, the discussion is going to is reaching to an end. But you know, it's so exciting, and we know uh, that if if we want to continue, we can continue talking for hours and hours about uh, 
about the details of cybersecurity, but I want to, to just say that you really gave us great pieces of advice, uh, great insights and where to start. This is actually what we need, what every small business and family owned business owner would want to know where to start from, right? What it takes to start and, and to start talking about cybersecurity in my company. So, uh, you know, before we end this discussion, what would be your, your, your last piece of advice to any business owner um, who is listening to us and watching us today uh, so that they can take this topic not only uh, seriously, but how they can start tackling it and executing on it? I, I guess my, my request would be for any owner just, just to take an interest in the topic. Like, don't treat it like, like, like it is some backroom IT job. Treat it as a business risk like HR, like finance, like some of these other business risks that you've done you know, your entire careers. Make sure it's elevated to a level where you don't have to be an expert at it. Um, you just need to know that what risks are out there and what you are willingly accepting in general. Like I said, it's a very similar principle to how the rest of your business is managed. My, my advice is just to bring cyber up to that same level um, and, and, and showing that kind of interest within your organizations. And that, that alone, honestly, just support from the CEO, support from the board, that leadership, uh, empowers people to realize it's important and, and you'll see progress just from that support alone. So that'd be my, my main tip. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Imran. I cannot uh, emphasize enough how important is uh, this topic, how cybersecurity and, uh, and data privacy and, and all this kind of topics that are you know, hot topics today. We want to, to just remind everyone that cyber attacks are happening almost every minute anywhere in this world, that people are getting hacked, uh, people are, are losing information. Uh, and we, we're not here to scare them, right? We are here just to tell them that it is there, it is real. And if it didn't happen to you yet, this doesn't mean that it might not happen, right? And th the thing is that when you enter a new house, you just don't enter and say, it's a safe neighborhood. I will not even have a door for my house, right? You still need to have a door. You still have to need to have a fence. You still need to have a lock, uh, no matter what. And it's the same for any business. And um and I think we all got the message. Uh, so thank you so much, Imran, for today. Uh, I want just to remind everyone that today it was the last webinar, live webinar for this season. Uh, we're going to take a break for summer, and then we're going to come back after summer with a, with a, with a new format for our live webinars. Um, also, you can watch all the recorded sessions on our YouTube channel, on our website. It, they are there, so you can watch all the recorded sessions. Thank you so much, Imran, for your time. Uh, I know that KPMG is doing a lot for their customers, and you've been, on, uh, you know, a leader as well in cybersecurity and in uh, IT advisory as well. So definitely I would encourage anyone who has even a tiny concern about their, their IT security, please reach out to Imran. Uh, he, he, he's a great person to work with and to start a discussion with. Uh, so don't be scared uh, of, of reaching out uh, to him. Thank you so much, Imran. I really appreciate your time. I want to thank you, thank KPMG as well for, for entrusting us with this live webinar. I know um, that it is a great topic to talk about and to share with our audience. With that, I want to wish you a great day. And I hope and I wish that we will meet again in the future and probably in a different format of live, of live webinars and even talk a little bit in more details about cybersecurity. Sounds good. Thanks again for having me and thanks everyone for joining. Have a good oh, rest of your day. My pleasure. Thank you so much and have a great day. Take care. Take care. Bye.